Sadhva is saying that it gives me great pleasure uh, to introduce Dr. Satyam Sach. Now, usually that's just a matter of form, but uh, frankly, today is one such occasion when I can really say with a great deal of truth that it does give me a great, great pleasure to introduce today's speaker to you. Uh, the reason being, he was one of my first students. Not only really the first, but at least one of the few students at the very beginning of my teaching career. And I've known him for a long time. He did his BS in physics, uh, ESC actually, at, from St. Xavier's College, Kolkata. And then he went on to do MSc in physics from the IIT Delhi. And uh, then PhD in physics, University of Southern Cali Carolina. Columbia. His research topics include high redshift galaxies, galaxy formation and evolution, and lots of other stuff. And at present, he is a staff scientist at the Space Telescope Science Institute, uh, something which is at the very center of excitement nowadays. And uh, frankly, this is something which is said usually about the speaker, but I should say the topic of today's talk needs no introduction, especially after the last few days. And I'm pretty sure everybody is very excited to hear about what's going on from somebody who has actually been directly involved in the process in setting up the gems web telespace telescope. So without further ado, I ask Leo Pop to start this talk. Thank you very much, sir. Um, uh, this, this is, uh, this is uh, an honor for me. Uh, to be to be able to present today um, at Isa Kolkata, it's it's one of the top uh, institutes, education institutes in India, especially since you asked me to give this presentation. Uh, and your, you know, as you as uh, it, it used to be the case, I think I am rem remembering it correctly that we never disobeyed you uh, <laughs> when you talked to us. So that that's exactly the thing. Um, and uh, at the same time, I'm also a little bit scared. Because honestly, uh, when I was in college, I could never answer a single question that that uh, Professor ADG asked me. Uh, so hopefully today, um, this will not be the case. Uh, and, uh, and, we'll... <laughs> and we'll see how, how that goes. Um, and the second thing is that, uh, uh, you know, a full disclaimer is that I, I do work at the GEMS, uh, at the Space Telescope Science Institute, but I'm not directly involved with the core team of the JW, uh, JWST GEMS or Space Telescope uh, team, but uh, I actually work in, uh, in another team uh, managing a telescope, which until recently, until yesterday, uh, has been the flagship uh, observatory, space observatory, the Hubble Space Telescope. But uh, as much as I hate, to admit that uh, since yesterday, uh, I think Hubble gladly passed on the crown to this new big player in the field. Um, so without much delay, I'll start talking about, um, uh, you know, a, a little bit of the journey of the James Webb Space Telescope, uh, which I, I witnessed. It's, just, it's mainly a journey of people, um, you know, who are involved in this uh, and, you know, what, whatever I witnessed, uh, you know, what, what happened in the last few years. Uh, and you know what the telescope is about. Um, so let me start. So this is a brief outline that I'll try to uh, you know stick to during the talk. And as you can see, this is an alternating sequence of questions and statements. Um, so let's start with the first question: that how JWST came to be. Um, now we know, we all know that Earth's atmosphere uh, filters out some of the light that reaches us. Uh, and whatever reaches us is also gets blurred by the atmospheric turbulences. So space telescopes are needed. So we we we, we need uh, specialized instruments in space to get to get some of the light and the, the information. So uh, starting in 1990s, uh, NASA launched a series of space space observa observatories. Um, we have the uh, the Spitzer Space Telescope, which uh, which is here, which operated between uh, 2003 and 2020, which is a, a, a an infrared telescope. Then you had uh, Chandra, which was launched in 1999 and it's still uh, continuing to operate and it, it observes in X-rays. Uh, and then we have Hubble, uh, which again launched in 1990 and it's continuing to do amazing science uh, in, in mainly ultraviolet and visible, but it has some uh, near infrared uh, capabilities. Uh, and, and they have shown us wonderful things. Uh, you know, here are some of the examples. Uh, you have uh, Crab Nebula, 
uh, where you know extra observations from Chandra. You have uh, you know Zita Fiji, a new a young star, uh, you know, showing shocks. Uh, this is IR observations from Spitzer, and you have this iconic uh, you know ring nebula from image from Hubble. Uh, and here we have uh, you know, an image of Antenna Galaxy where all these telescopes combine together uh, where, to show different different physics in different wavelength bands. Um, uh, so these are all, all extremely uh, you know, useful uh, knowledge that you, we got from these telescopes. And this is another example. Uh, you know, this is, is from nearby objects. We will go to the, the you know, earliest galaxies in the universe. And this uh, image here, you, you probably all recognize. Um, this is the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. Uh, it was taken in 2014, uh, over 25 days, about 600 hours of observing. Um, and this image contains approximately 10,000 galaxies uh, that extend back in time uh, to within actually a few hundred million years of, of the Big Bang. Um, now, uh, so, so when we, we look out into space, we are actually looking back in time. So the light arriving uh, at Earth from these furthest objects in the universe uh, is the light that actually left those objects billions of years ago. Uh, so we see these objects not as they are today, uh, but they as they appeared at that time when the light left them. Uh, here is a sort of a cartoon uh, description of the early of the very early universe uh, as the universe cooled down. You know, right after Big Bang, of over thirteen and a half billion years uh, ago, there was there were the dark ages where there was nothing, no light. Uh, but then the very first astrophysical sources of light formed and started heating and ionizing uh, the cold neutral gas permeating the universe, as you can see here. Um, uh, but during this period, which is also known as the era of uh, reionization, the universe was a very different place. Uh, the gas between galaxies was largely opaque to energetic light, uh, which, which of course makes it difficult to, to observe these young galaxies. Uh, however, Baryonic structure of the universe grew and the universe became increasingly ionized. As you can see, uh, you know, the ionization is increasing uh, until it is fully ionized. However, we still have a lot of questions. Uh, we want to know, uh, you know, how exactly this process uh, happened uh, and, you know, how long it took. Uh, to, so, so to understand all these, all, you know, to answer all these questions, we need to study the ionizing light itself, uh, which was primarily emitted in UV uh, from these early sources. Um, and you know how 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 they uh, created the transparent universe we see today, uh, but how do we capture that light? Now uh, there is there is uh, you know uh, here is this one physics that that affects us uh, in that way uh, you know to to get that light. As you know that as light travels in expanding universe, it stretches, and this is also known as the cosmological redshift. Um, so light uh, which was emitted from the stars as ultraviolet. Uh, gets stretched uh, and ultraviolet and visible, it gets stretched and it becomes, uh, uh, you know, longer wavelength light and becomes infrared light. Uh, so, so if we want to study those young uh, objects, we want to, we will have to go to the, uh, the infrared part of the, of the spectrum of the electromagnetic spectrum to, to see these first galaxies, the first sources. Um, and we, 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 we also need a big observatory because they are inherently very faint and here enters NASA's James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, here is just just a cartoon, again a cartoon diagram of this uh, you know, electromagnetic spectrum. Here is the visible where Hubble is still the king, uh, and uh, UV and visible. Um, and then we had Spitzer Space Telescope in in you know a little bit far in the infra infrared. But here is James Webb Space Telescope. It, it's spanning this entire near and the middle infrared uh, 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 regime. But but also this is a much bigger telescope. This is way bigger than Spitzer Space Telescope. So this can do what Spitzer can do, only much better. In fact, this is the resolution of the special resolution of this telescope is almost as good as Hubble. So it can see as clearly as Hubble does, but in a in a wavelength uh, range which is really important to study these early uh, early sources. Um, so uh, it, it, you know scientists and engineers had a lot of information already. Um, you know, to build on when, when designing the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, uh, and, and, you know, the planning began in 1989. In fact, uh, the, the planning began in a conference which was hosted at Space Telescope Science Institute. Um, and for context, Hubble was launched in 1990. Uh, new concepts and designs for waves, uh, you know, like the one we, we, we've shown here, um, you know, started coming in. 
Um, however, in 2002, it was renamed as the James Webb Space Telescope. Initially, it was it was known as the Next Generation Space Telescope, a next generation to Hubble. Um, the construction began in 2002. Uh, now, however, new technologies were needed, uh, along with the battery of tests at every stage of development. Uh, and, and as you know, that, that involved a lot of delays and postponing of the launch. However, scientists and engineers took time to ensure that each instrument operates as planned. Um, and, and we are glad that they did because we'll see uh, you know, what, what the effect was. Uh, now, let's take a look at some of the cool uh, technical details of, of Webb. Um, and, and it is a very special observatory. So, uh, you know, here are some of the images of, uh, you know, of, of, of JWST as it was being assembled. Um, now, several innovative and powerful new technologies make uh, Webb's ambitious science goals possible. Uh, examples include specialized optics to align the mirrors, detectors that can capture and separate light from hundreds of sources um, at once, and, and then thermal control systems. Uh, these technologies make WAVE the most sophisticated and complex space telescope ever created. Uh, no, WAVE, WAVE is a collection of movable parts, um, and it actually was designed to fold into a compact formation uh, so that it can actually fit, uh, you know, the payload capsule on, on, a, on a telescope, on, on a, on a uh, rocket, which is only five meter, which is much, much smaller than WAVE when it is fully deployed. So you can imagine, you know, this is truly a testament to the ingenuity of, of you know, human uh, smartness, we can say. Uh, so here's a look at the, 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 the mirror, uh, the now iconic mirror of, of Webb, uh, which is 6.6 .6 meter diameter primary mirror. It's, it's, it's quite large. Um, and you know, for context, you have this is this is Hubble's primary mirror, and for context, this is a typical human being. Um, and then um, you know, we actually had to have this this larger mirror mirror to, to match Hubble because of the wavelength that it, it observes in. It's a near infrared, so the resolution will 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 match Hubble only when the the telescope mirror is big. Uh, the mirror also needs to be uh, stable at very cold temperatures at, at 40 Kelvin. Uh, which is about minus 235 degrees centigrade um, and this is made of beryllium which is six times stronger than uh, stronger than steel and two-thirds the density of aluminium so strong but very light um, there are 18 hexagonal stack segments as you can see here these 18 segments there um, and and they are hexagons so the mirror can be adjusted to align to form a circular aperture uh, since Webb's mirror needs to fold uh, to fit, engineers ensured that these 18 mirror segments can also be adjusted to form a single perfect focus. And each mirror segment has several actuators. They can be moved independently, which is which is amazing. Uh, and that actually helps us to to create a very perfect uh, you know, focus, a very very nice focus uh, for the telescope. Um, and also, as you probably all have already all already heard, each segment is coated uh, in a very thin layer of gold, uh, about one thousand atoms thick. Uh, gold was selected because it's the best uh, reflector of uh, infrared light. Light, but uh, let me tell you, this is not a lot of gold. So uh, you know, it's it's safe from robbers, uh, I guess. It's just forty-eight grams or something. Um, so uh, let's take a look at the next thing that uh, that is also very iconic now is the is the heat shield um that um you know that that the web has um, now web needs to be cooled because in that infrared wavelengths um uh, web's own emission can actually overwhelm all the sources that is actually trying to see so it needs to be cooled down so that the emission also is down and the background is, is significantly reduced in fact in the in the mid infrared region uh, for one of its instruments, uh, Wave's own emission is still the highest source of background uh, in, 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 in that, that uh, regime. Um, so, so the point is, Hubble, uh, sorry, Wave needs to be cooled down. And it, it does that in two ways. One is passive cooling and the other is uh, active cooling. Uh, this, the, this, the sun shield, it's actually a five layer tennis course size, uh, sized uh, structure. Uh, it provides the passive cooling. Uh, there are five layers. The first layer, which is the sun-facing layer, uh, it's at a temperature of 400 Kelvin, which is almost 125 degrees centigrade. Uh, and that's uh, about two thousandths of an inch thick. Um, and the other four layers, they are only one thousandth of an inch thick. Uh, and the innermost layer, which is closest to the mirror, 
here, um, this layer, that is maintained at a temperature of 40 Kelvin, which is minus 235 degrees centigrade. This is all passive cooling. Um, and then the, uh, the, the sun shield was also designed to be deployed by 139 tiny mechanical motors called actuators, um, which uh, with the addition of eight motors and thousands of other components uh, helped the sun shield to unfold and, and, and be taught in, in, this, in this current shape. Um, now, wave science instruments are housed behind the mirror uh, here. Uh, and then there are some other components uh, on the sun facing side. These components don't need to be cooled down. Now, these are like the antenna, the communication uh, arrays, the solar power array, the steering and control and star trackers, things like that. Uh, however, there is also a cryo cooler. This is the active uh, uh, ingredient uh, of, of, um, of the active cooling. Uh, this is essentially to support the, the instrument called MIRI because that is the, uh, the, the mid-infrared instrument which needs to be cooled down even further beyond uh, cooler than 40 Kelvin. Um, <clears throat> so these are the, you know, the, 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 the very cool thing about, uh, this, uh, about this telescope. Uh, but here is a look at the science in instruments that that's on board web um, there are several there are four instruments uh, and they are uh, NISPEC, the near infrared spectrograph as one of uh, waves versatile tools for near infrared spectrography uh, spectroscopy then there is uh, waves near infrared imager and slitless spectrograph which is uh, which is uh, called the nearest but this is also combined with the fine guidance sensor now fine guidance sensor is used uh, 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 so that wave can point precisely and, um, and so that it can get high quality images. Then there is the near infrared camera or near cam. This is the primary imager uh, on, this, on this telescope. And it delivers very high resolution imaging and, and as well as spectroscopy, uh, slitless spectroscopy for a wide variety of investigations. And finally, we have the mid infrared instrument, MIRI, um, which is another powerhouse on this, uh, on this telescope. It can take images and gather spectra as well. Uh, it, as you can see, it covers uh, you know, a longer wavelength range in the infrared um, and, um, and it, it will study cooler objects, which, which emits in, in the mid-infrared uh, region. Um, so, and this is a very important instrument as well because you know, this is the only instrument on board which does the observations in this mid-infrared uh, regime. Overall, uh, these four instruments combine to have 17 different observing modes, uh, which which web is capable of observing in, um, and and each of them needed to be commissioned separately. Uh, this is just uh, you know a diagram to show the uh, the footprint or as we call it the the FOV, the field of view of these individual instruments on 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 board uh, web. Uh, you know this is just projected onto sky. Uh, these four instruments are here as labeled. Um, now let's take a step back and, and see the scale of collaboration that was needed to, to materialize this mission. Uh, WAVE has been an international collaboration since the very beginning. In addition to the United States, 14 other countries, uh, you know, Canada and, and 13 countries in the Europe, uh, uh, they, they are involved in building the WAVE telescope. Um, additional mem member states in Europe also contribute to the European uh, Space Agency, ESA, which is uh, a partner of, of NASA. As you can see, NASA partnered with with uh, Canadian Space Agency and uh, and ESA uh, for this mission, um, and uh, and NASA of course is the lead agency and has the overall um, responsibility for this mission. Uh, more than 120 American, European, and Can Canadian universities and organizations and companies contributed to to Web. Uh, so so JWST is an example of things that we the humans can achieve when we work together. And, and not against each other. <laughs> um, so this is this is one of the, the wonderful aspects of, of web. Um, now comes the role of Space Telescope Science Institute. Uh, you know, SDSCI has played a very important role in the development and launch of, of JWST, uh, but it is going to play the most important role uh, from now on and it, since yesterday actually. Um, so web's mission Operation center is housed at uh, STSCI, so so you know command and control of the spacecraft is done uh, from this building, from our, our headquarters, um, and then uh, STSCI is also Web Science Operation Center, uh, where uh, you know it will uh, and and also uh, we will archive Web's data in in mass archive. 
So we will we will we will share we will have the data and we'll share the data with all the researchers and we'll share web science and discoveries, which actually started from yesterday. Um, uh, just to put in context, uh, STSCI has been very successfully uh, working as the Science Operations Center for the Hubble Space Telescope over two decades now. And it will also be the Science Operations Center for the next telescope, uh, the, uh, the Roman Space Telescope. Um, so we have a lot of experience uh, in, in uh, doing the science operations for the space telescopes. Um, now, let's take a look at what are the questions that WAVE was designed to answer. Uh, as we know that um, WAVE is designed to, to capture faint infrared light. So, um, you know, it has unparalleled sensitivity and resolution to detect the faint infrared light here. Um, this will this telescope will match the incredible image quality offered by Hubble, and it has already matched, as you have seen. Uh, uh, but but the, again, the most important part is that this is doing that in infrared light instead of visible light. Um, Webb will actually combine with Hubble and other space observatories or ground-based observatories, and they will work together. Um, they will target some of the same regions of the sky. They will coordinate uh, to provide simultaneous or follow-up observations in infrared light, um, uh, and and. And with that, Hubble uh, Web will 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 answer uh, some very important questions uh, that we have. Uh, Web will look at the very very first galaxies, as I, as I mentioned before. Um, this is an example of one of these galaxies here. This is uh, only about 400 million years after the Big Bang. Uh, so this is this is one of the farthest galaxies that we have seen. Um, and as you can see, this is faint and very irregular. Um, so very, very difficult to see with, with anything that we, we had before web, but web will start seeing these things more, more regularly. And on top of that, web will also help us to study galaxy evolution. It will look at, at, at galaxies at different epochs of time, and not only that, different parts of galaxies that, that emit in uh, infrared. So it will help us to study galaxy evolution, uh, especially when it combines with, uh, with likes of Hubble. Um, it will also help us to look uh, to study black holes. Uh, for example, it can peer through the uh, you know the the obscuring dust at the center of our own galaxy uh, of Milky Way and look at uh, the supermassive black hole that that our galaxy hosts, the Sagittarius A. Uh, but also in nearby galaxies, Webb will get high resolution spectra, try to find out the composition of the chemical composition of the gas that's feeding these black holes, uh, you know, and then study the rotation of stars and gas around those black holes, try to find the mass. Um, and then, uh, you know, this will, JWST will also study quasars. You know, quasars, as you know, they are very distant, very bright, active supermassive black holes. Um, they are among actually the brightest uh, objects in the Eastern universe. And, and JWST will be studying them, their jets, uh, their outflows, uh, and, and, and their co-evolution of these quasars with, with their galaxies themselves. Um, so this will be a, a wonderful uh, source of information for us. Uh, however, beyond that, uh, Webb will also start, uh, study stars, star formation. Now here is, a, is an example of, uh, you know, uh, uh, this is a nebula called uh, the Carina Nebula. Uh, where you can see uh, this this is the visible light image and this is the infrared light and you can see this you know this this gigantic columns of gas and dust uh invisible but when you look at it in infrared you will see uh stars trying to uh, uh starting to peek through uh you know this this veil because uh you know infrared light helps us to go through this this these layers of gas and dust and see this the young stars that are being born inside them um now, of course, with JWST, this will be even better, uh, uh, you know, with the sensitivity and, and uh, you know, the size of this, of this telescope, we can see, uh, you know, further details, uh, intricate details of these of the star forming regions. Um, we'll also uh, detect chemical composition of the star forming regions. We'll, we'll have, we'll, uh, you know, look at, uh, you know, major stars of different size, mass, age, color, temperature, evolution stage, uh, and formation environment. Uh, we, we actually can see uh, these newly formed stars where, uh, you know, through the, through the cocoons of their, um, you know, dust and, 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 and gas. We, we can study the whole molecular clouds that uh, give birth to these uh, young stars. 
uh, we can also study the gas and dust ejected from dying stars. Uh, and, and, and not only that, we can also study the molecules between stars uh, in the interstellar medium. So JWST will give us a comprehensive view of, of star formation and the clouds that uh, you know, give rise to these young stars. Uh, we'll also look at uh, planets that are in our own solar system. We'll look at the, um, the, uh, the atmospheres and the clouds of Mars, Jupiter, um, and Uranus, Neptune, uh, these, these gas uh, giant planets. Uh, but not only that, we would also look at planets of other stars uh, in our own um, galaxy, uh, you know, the, the planets we call as, we, we, we know as exoplanets uh, or extrasolar planets. Um, and and this, will be, this will be possible because JWST has the sensitivity to infrared where most of the warm planets um, emit. And it's such a huge telescope, the resolution is amazing. Um, so here's an example uh, example of of how we can do that. Um, so here, this is this is a technique called coronagraphy, where the main star, uh, the actual the host star, is is obscured, and you can see the the planets or orb orbiting the, uh, the the star. Uh, JWST will be able to do it. Uh, it has a coronagraph. It has a couple of coronagraphs on board, um, and and we will we will get this wonderful um, you know images uh, from JWST. Um, and uh, JWST will also look at transmission spectroscopy of planets, uh, which is, uh, you know, when, uh, when a planet goes in front of the star, um, then you can actually see uh, the, the molecules in its atmosphere being imprinted on the starlight when you look at the spectrum. So this is called transmission spectroscopy. Um, Web will is designed to do this very efficiently. Now, here as an example, this is a you know a transmission spectroscopy uh, of of our own planet as Web would see it if Web was actually going to look at us. But unfortunately, no, uh, Web is not going to observe it. it. The sun will blind it. So, uh, but this is just an example here. Uh, Web will be doing a lot of these things. So, if you are interested in extra extra solar planets or exoplanet studies, stay tuned. Web is coming with with a lot of cool science in that in this area. Um, how am I doing at time? This is half an hour so far. I think. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, so now let's take a look at the launch. Um, so in the pre-dawn hours of Sunday, uh, uh, sorry, Saturday. It was a Saturday, December twenty-five. 2021, uh, JWST launched. It launched uh, at 7.20 a.m. Eastern Standard Time uh, on an Arian 5 rocket that uh, French counterparts provided um, uh, from Europe, Europe Space Center in French, uh, French Guyana, South, South America. And uh, 27 minutes into the flight, uh, the upper stage of the rocket let Web go. And this is this amazing view that we have all probably seen by now. Um, where Web is slowly drifting away. Uh, I was very emotional too <laughs> when I saw this uh, uh, live. Um, and this was actually this is our last uh, high resolution view of this telescope uh, as it as is going away. Um, and at this point, engineers uh, in the Web's Mission Operations Center at STSCI uh, took control of the observatory and as it as it went uh, to to its orbit. Um, in, in L2. So as, as you have heard that, you know, this is going to be going to be parked uh, or, you know, Web is going to orbit um, at Sun Earth Lagrange point, uh, often referred to as L2, a point where the gravity from the Sun and Earth balance. So this is good because then the telescope doesn't have to constantly fire thrusters uh, to, you know, uh, to, to counter gravity. Um, and this, this point is about 1.5 million kilometers or 900 30,000 miles uh, from Earth, uh, and it is on the far side of Earth uh, from Sun. So at L2, WEB can maintain a safe distance from the bright light of Sun, the Moon, and Earth, um, while also maintaining its position relative to us. So we can still communicate with it, uh, but it's at a safe distance. Um, <clears throat> uh, so this is how our, uh, you know, JWST will orbit uh, us. Now, on its way, um, 
uh, you know, as, as I mentioned that uh, web was actually folded uh, so that it could fit into the payload fairing. Um, but then uh, after launch, as it traveled towards the L2 point, it slowly started to unfold like a butterfly. Uh, and, and as you can see in the sequence here, you know, this is, uh, you know, the first configuration and then it started deploying its, uh, its uh, uh, you know, sun shield. Um, and then the Huygen antenna came, came here and then it started to unfold its mirror structure. Uh, so there are a lot of steps that, that were, that, you know, that was uh, there. Uh, especially the, the the deploying tensioning and separating web sun shield because this was never done before uh, and uh, everybody was scared uh, to be honest uh, everyone <laughs> we were not sure how this will go uh, and it went flawlessly um, and i can say that there were about 200 single point failure points in this entire thing so single point failure means if one of these points fail we lose the telescope uh, we lose the observatory but all those 200 single point failure um, you know, events, they went uh, flawlessly, no problem at all. Um, and and, and this, this entire deployment and commissioning, of course, it was done very, very carefully, very uh, you know, slowly to make sure everything is okay. It took time, it took about six months. Um, you know, uh, the engineers uh, carefully activated and confirmed each and every instrument is working properly before the first um, image, which was still unfocused but first image of a star was delivered uh, i think about two months after it was launched um, and then of course you know uh, uh, scientists proceeded to um, you know align the optics carefully uh, and i think in four about four months after launch web completed its first orbit around l2 uh, and uh, and it, it took the first focused image this showed the mirrors are aligned and the alignment also exceeded expectations this is this is something uh, uh, this has been a, a you know a theme with with web is that it continues to exceed expectations um then all the 17 modes as i mentioned before of the instrument modes they were all separately commissioned and everything went flawlessly again and after six months over uh, after six months of this of this entire procedure over the last weekend, actually, James Webb Space Telescope was fully commissioned uh, and it began its routine science operations. But the commissioning data and the early science observations showed uh, the observatory exceeded expectation in almost all areas. Um, and we are actually going to look at that. Um, the first look of what JWST is capable of doing. Here we go. This is something you have seen. Uh, you know, uh, splashed across the front pages of newspapers and, and, and uh, TV channels. Uh, so this is what we get when Webb's spectacular imaging capability combines with, with gravitation lensing. So this is, uh, a, you know, a cluster um, that's uh, SMAX 0723, which is gravitation lensing galaxies beyond this, beyond, uh, behind the cluster. Uh, so this is a uh, near-time imaging using six filters. So this is a multicolor composite. Uh, the integration time is 12 hours. Now remember, previously we, sh we had seen the Hubble Ultra D field, which was 20 hours uh, of integration time. Uh, sorry, 600 hours of integration time, 20 days. Um, you can see this is comparable and even more. Uh, we, get, we, are, we are actually seeing many, many more galaxies. Uh, is this because Web is higher in spatial resolution? No, because it's more sensitive and it is sensitive in infrared light which shows many more distant galaxies. As you can see, uh, galaxies are everywhere. And, and this is the first time I'm an extragalactic astronomer. And I have always seen that the stellar astronomers always look down upon us. So that, oh, stellar astronomers have always thousands and thousands of stars to look at. But you know, extragalactic astronomers only had a handful of galaxies. But now is the time, this is payback. <laughs> we are now looking at this, this incredible um, Yeah. This is uh, Dibyendun on this. I have a question for you. I'm sure, uh, curious yeah. about this image, um, mm -hmm. and precisely the, the point of view that you're actually talking about right now. Mm -hmm. Why yes. don't I see the whole sky full of stars, like one whole bright thing? So why is it that the galaxies are standing out? And, yeah. and I'm not seeing the stars. Yeah. So that I'm very curious about that. Yes. So, well, you are actually seeing a lot of stars. Uh, so if you look at this image here, it is all this all these bright objects where these spikes are standing out. These are the stars, right? 
However, these stars are stars in our own galaxy and which are much closer to us. So their angular separation in the sky, when you are looking at these tiny spots in the sky, uh, so the angular separation between stars from our own galaxy, from a point within our own galaxy are pretty big actually. So when we just look at a tiny patch of the sky, there are not many stars in that tiny patch of the sky. But if you just take a step back, if you go back and back, uh, you know, in fact, if you start looking at our own galaxy as a whole, you will actually see all the stars. It's just the, you know, our perspective, our angular perspective from within the galaxy. That's why we are we are not seeing. And of course, if you have a wide wide view or you know wide field, then more and more stars will start coming in, and we will not like that. As I said, we, we are extragalactic astronomers. I am extragalactic astronomer. So okay. I think like it's, it's worth that. making the point here that this is really like if you if you hold a, I mean this is the simile that I, I read in the internet. If you hold a small grain of sand at arm's yeah. length. That is all you're seeing here, which is kind of quite yeah, yeah. amazing perspective, actually. Yes, exactly. This is exactly that. So we are we are looking at a very tiny part of the sky. So that's the point. Since we are, the angular size of this of this is is tiny, so we are seeing we are not seeing a whole lot of the stars here. But even that tiny part of the sky is now showing so many galaxies, and not only that, the variety of it. You can see galaxies of all shapes and sizes. And of course, you can see some some of the gravitational arcs, you know, the gravitational lensing arcs that are showing these galaxies even in in even greater detail. But look at this. I mean, this is just this tiny point, the tiny patch of sky, and we see this 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 thousands of galaxies showing up. So this is what James Webb will do. We will, uh, when you know, as time progresses, we will see this you know this incredible wealth of galaxy data. Uh, coming from uh, from this, this telescope, um, so so I, I'll, I'll just move on to the uh, next. I, I would like to stay here because, as I say, this is this is much closer to heart. But this is another example. Um, this is uh, you know Stefan's quintet. Uh, this is a visual grouping of five galaxies, um, uh, and, and it's in fact this galaxy here. This is not. Uh, gravitationally connected to these other four galaxies. These these other four galaxies they form a cluster. This is much closer to us, about I think 440 million light years from us. But these the other four are about 300 million light years uh, from us. Um, but you can see once again uh, the incredible detail of this galaxy. This is unprecedented. Now now in this galaxy itself, which is 40 million light years from us, we actually now see individual stars and individual star clusters. Uh, which is amazing. And we, of course, see, you know, the, the gas clouds. Uh, here, this is uh, gravitational interacting. These four galaxies are interacting with each other. And you can see the tidal tails. And in fact, in the tidal tails, you can see stars and star forming, star formation happening. Now, we know we, we have been, uh, you know, we have been theorizing about it and we have seen some of the evidence of these things, but not in this detail so far. And you can see how gas is being, uh, you know, being being ripped apart, um, and the shock waves that's forming. This is incredible detail once again. And on top of that, you can once again see all this all these uh, background galaxies popping up. Now, I want it to remember this was not the the aim to detect the background galaxies for this particular image. This is not a deep field. But someone, one of my colleagues, just said that with JWST, each image is a deep field. <laughs> so we will keep on seeing these background galaxies over and over again. Um, so, so this is another example. This is uh, you know, the Carina Nebula that we saw before. Uh, again, this is in extraordinary detail that, that JWST captured this. We can now see uh, lots of young stars within these gas clouds because you know, now it's transparent to to the uh, the IR, we, we are seeing amazing details of shock waves and and you know something like this that is still still unexplained. Uh, we we get to see you know the ages of this of these gas clouds and the dust clouds that's being bombarded by the young stars here, and we can in fact see the ionized gas being uh, you know being jetted out from the surface of the clouds. Um, so so yeah, this is breathtaking, <laughs> um, and we also saw another uh, a, a, a very close look at the death of a star. This is a white dwarf. It's actually shedding his outer uh, layers of gas. 
um, and and you can see this this these layers are formed here. The the, the left image here is a uh, is a uh, near cam image. Uh, the right image is actually a mirror image in the media uh, in the media infrared. And one thing is very clear is that the different kinds of details you see in these two different wave bands. Here in the in the near infrared image, you see the dust clouds much more. Um, in much more details, you can actually see the wave patterns. I, you know, hear the shocks uh, that that has occurred here. You can see the channels, uh, you know, uh, the ionizing radiation made uh, through these, uh, you know, glass gas uh, envelopes. Um, you can actually see the ionized gas in the center, and of course, uh, you can see the, you know, the one of the two two stars that's there at the center. However, in the in the medium uh, infrared image, you actually see both the stars. Uh, this is the white so, one. Can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, so, I mean, since you said that it's actually being observed in infrared, right? So, there's a color mapping involved. So, how is that done? Because this color looks so natural. Yeah. Oh, yes, it does. It, these are these are all called false color images because it, they are made to look uh, appealing to our sky. So, this is done. It, it's very simple in a sense that, you know, even in the infrared, you have, uh, in the relative terms, you have blue and red. Right, because there are all these filters. So the the lowest uh, wavelength filters you can call them blue, and the right uh, the the highest wavelength filters you can call them red. It just assign blue colors to the uh, the lowest wavelength filters and red colors to the highest wavelength filters. So it's just mapping. Um, of course, otherwise we wouldn't see any of it, right? So uh, this is false color, <laughs> just to make sure we sort of understand these different things. No, so, no, my question was like, yeah. is it uh, specific to the gems in the sense that suppose your instrument has a slightly wider, uh, let's say infrared itself, right? Your lower uh, mm -hmm. frequency or higher frequency may be slightly different in some other telescope. In that case, color mapping will be different? Or? It could be. Because yes. this image could... looks so real. I mean, that's what it my does. curiosity yes, is. Yes. <laughs> Well, so because it actually depends on your choice when you make these false color images. What you, if you want to match different wavelengths with the same color, you can definitely do it. For example, here, this blue color actually represents, uh, you know, high energy radiation or low wavelength in the infrared. Of course, in the infrared, the orange uh, it it uh, signifies wavelength at a higher. Uh, you know, uh, higher wavelength or, you know, high wavelength, high wavelength filters, of course, because this is ionizing radiation, even in the infrared. Uh, uh, in fact, this is more, more like a red, uh, almost visual red in our, uh, from our point of view. Um, and this is definitely uh, infrared. Uh, this shows dust, which is much cooler, which radiates in, in, in deeper in the, in the infrared. And, but the ionizing radiations are, are, are much closer to our, our visual in this case. Um, and of course, you know, you, you see all these channels um, here in this one, which is the middle, the mid infrared, you can actually see the white dwarf because the dust cloud around the white dwarf is now glowing in mid infrared. That's why you are seeing it. Here, the red light actually corresponds to the blue light here, uh, although they are not at the exact same wavelength, but we are just in the mid infrared, we are saying this is high energy radiation, this is low energy radiation. Of course, this is the dust cloud. Um, Okay, thanks. So I'll... They were bomb. So, sorry to interrupt once again. So, no so problem. do you, so are this death of star or something, is it like something new observation by this, uh, by this no. gems telescope or so therefore, no. Okay. Is... Maybe Hubble has already seen it, correct? Yes. Yes. Hubble has seen, uh, so we, we know all of these things from Hubble. Definitely you know what this, okay. how these things happen. However, the thing that James Webb uh, is doing here is adding incredible details to our view that already that Hubble already provided. So we are now going to learn even more, uh, okay. which we, we we couldn't. We were you know we had theories, we had you know theories about shock, but we couldn't see them clearly. But now we do, because Hubble, although it has some infrared capability. This is definitely no match for its own ultraviolet or uh, uh, visual capability. But this is where James Webb comes in. It actually shows us what Hubble sees, but in the infrared, where all the information are in the infrared, actually. So, so that's the thing that okay. um, uh, James So if I make, make a comment here, Devapam, uh, mm -hmm. I think the advantage of, 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 of looking in infrared uh, in terms of being able to look further back in time and doing mm -hmm. deep field Basically, it comes from the fact of 
for the wavelength right because you have dust particles yeah. which which yeah. really scatters off and and diffuses light from you know the further you go back yeah. infrared light has the capability of look, looking basically looking through dust exactly. so you can so say that jw jwst has lifted the veil of dust that yeah. that yes. sort of you know uh, you know puts a shadow over the distant universe in many ways Jwst generally yeah. will be able to make you look much deeper into the universe. One number one, number two is of course the details that you talked about in terms of resolution, by virtue of the fact that the aperture is so much larger. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, that's a very nice way of putting it. That it it does lift the veil of dust uh, and dense gas, of course, as well. Um, and yes, so infrared is is twofold useful. Is the you know if you look at farther into uh, uh, into time. Uh, because of stretching, of cosmological stretching of wavelength, as well as in the nearby universe, uh, you know, because infrared can actually penetrate the, the veil of dust and, and dense gas, you can see a lot of stuff that been obscured before um, and in, in much greater detail. So this is exactly what we are seeing here uh, being demonstrated. Uh, and finally, one of the last uh, science release, the early science observation release uh, uh, was the spectrum this is a transmission spectrum, uh, as I mentioned before, you know, uh, the transmission spectrum that you can take of, of a planet's atmosphere uh, as it passes in front of its star. Um, this transmission spectrum was, uh, this was, I think, um, WASP 96b. Um, and once again, it's just because of the sensitivity and resolution of the spectra uh, on board of the instruments. Uh, and this was taken by uh, Nearest actually in its source mode, the single object spectroscopy mode, um, and this is the first spectrum ever obtained in the uh, infrared, uh, and, and and the wavelength range is 0.6 to about 0.2.8 microns. So uh, this wavelength range itself is unprecedented; it's never been studied before. Uh, that's one spectrum covers the entire wavelength range, and you are now starting to see these molecular bumps. Uh, in this case, they are all water, uh, um, uh, water molecule, um, in 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 this detail, in with the significance of detection. Uh, you can see this is a model of the uh, of the atmosphere for this uh, for this planet, uh, and and we now know that this planet is about uh, the atmosphere of the planet is about 1350 degrees Fahrenheit, about 200, 725 degrees uh, uh, centigrade. Uh, again, this is the most detailed infrared exoplanet spectrum ever obtained, and this was just one observation with uh, with JWST. So it, this is just to demonstrate how it it can uh, do stuff to science. But of course, you know when actually it will be looking at all these exoplanets, there will be multiple such observations which will be combined to even uh, uh, to give us even higher signal to noise. So um, so that's. Uh, that's what I just wanted to share with you, um, uh, you know, in terms of the journey of JWST. But I just want you all to, uh, I just wanted to remind uh, you all one thing is that about two years prior to this launch, the world shut down because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and all the last minute critical readiness rehearsals and these reviews, um, they were all carried out by staff, mostly working from home. Uh, you know that the launch and commissioning also, you know, even the launch itself and, and the recent commissioning that also happened under the shadow of the pandemic. Um, so, so this is truly a testament to the human will and, and courage and cooperation and collaboration and understanding, right? Um, and so, so of course, you know, JWST was designed to to showcase uh, human ingenuity and you know our bravery, uh, but in the end. Uh, the mission truly turned out to be a story of human excellence uh, in in all areas. So with that, I'll I'll thank you all for your patience. Uh, it's quite late, um, and uh, you know I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Uh, 
yeah so hi dr dev this was really a great talk and thanks for giving an overview of uh, what we are seeing every day on social media so myself sakshi and i work with professor devindu nandi uh, i am mostly involved in modeling part of the star planet interaction and sort of determining the impact of these interactions on the atmospheres of the exoplanets through modeling right now but i am also interested in atmospheric retrieval techniques and uh, i worked with some test data and uh, but this was just to explore the field right now so mm -hmm. i was wondering if uh, i mean let's say i want to start working on observation so how can i get access to this jwst and hubble data and as a beginner how can i learn more techniques on this jwst data extraction and interpretation i see there were some workshop organized by early release science and i did attend them but uh, yeah other than that if you can suggest something that would be nice Sure. Yes. Um, so, in terms of Hubble, um, or, or as well as JWST, um, so these these are um, you know, the observations, the new observations you can do by by proposing for time on these telescopes, and and anyone can do it. Um, and you know, this is a competitive process. When you are uh, when you are awarded time, you you can actually use these telescopes to to look at your targets. On top of that, you have archives. So there are other people who are uh, you know, making these observations. So you can, so they do their science, but which may not be the exact science you are looking for, but the data is there in the archive. Uh, sometimes these are, these are all processed. Sometimes these are raw data, which you need to process, but you can access the data from the archive and you can you know, uh, uh, do your science on it. And in terms of um, you know, data analysis, uh, we, you know the, the people working with the, with the instrument teams um, now are creating uh, Jupyter notebooks because most of this is going to be Python based. Uh, so they are creating Jupyter notebooks and they are hosting in public repositories. These are not complete; these are you know still in in progress. So, but if you want to check, um, you know the JWST, um, you know uh, the information website from NASA or even STSCI, you will actually get links to these all these. Uh, data analysis tools and you can check them out uh, they should they should be at least a little bit helpful in understanding the data, data analysis part sir Does why uh, sir hello yeah hello uh, sir why these uh, spikes are uh, visible in some star or some uh, uh, only six are visible uh yes these are uh -huh. these are the diffraction spikes um as you have uh, learned in in optics um so yeah I, I don't know if you can maybe this is a good one uh what well, yeah so well let's just keep this one this is taking a long time to ah uh, sorry um so these are diffraction spikes that are that are happening because of the structure of the mirror and the support structure of the secondary mirror that's that's are on on this telescope now this is unique for jwst that you have six spikes visible because if you remember um the the telescope has 18 segments so this has and and the, the way it is this design it has this six axis symmetry uh in its field of view right or you know six ways symmetrical i don't know if i'm saying it the correct word and that's why you are actually seeing these six spikes uh, for jwst which is not the case with hubble i think i just showed a hubble image here uh maybe maybe the next one Yes, so this is actually Hubble image of the same diff field that we have seen. Uh, and you can hear, you can see only four. And of course, there are a few others because some of the images were taken with a different filter at a different orientation. So they also show up here. Um, but yeah, you can clearly see how distinct they are from, from JWST. So, okay, so if the mm -hmm. is Koshik here, yes. so probably, yes. you know, probably you are aware about uh, one of the big uh, discussion that is happening in recent time uh, in in cosmology is about this Hubble tension, and you know where uh, there are um, the issue is about you know the uh, the the value of this Hubble constant uh, today that you that you can uh, measure from the local observations like you know galaxies uh, and all this local observation, and the value that you extract from some CMB observations they they have a very large discrepancy order of uh, five sigma more than five sigma mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. I mean, if I understand, if, so this this telescope is supposed to going to measure this 
low red shift observations very well i mean you know you are showing some pictures of galaxy in terms of time so are we expect some uh, like new set of data uh, from of of this local h0 measurement because that's where all that you know all this so called uncertainties are uh, you know people are concerned about yes any, well any? Uh, with jwst of course you will get more uh, precision in terms of the astrophysical or local measurements of of uh, of h naught um, because you know you can as you can see the the gravitation lensing class cluster as shown shown in the diff field you can use this this uh, enhanced detail and measure time delay there of course um, and then uh, of course supernovae will be another thing that uh, mm -hmm. uh, that jwst will study more of its environment. So JWST will actually shed light more on the environment of the supernovae so that we can understand the nature of the standard candle better, um, you know, in terms of its dust and environment. So, so that will definitely be, uh, definitely be useful in, in achieving better precision um, uh, of, the, of the Hubble constant measurement with astrophysical. But I don't know if that will resolve the tension. We all hope it will. But we will we'll see. No, so so therefore therefore is there like a how does this collaboration works? Like for example, you, the this telescope is giving the data, uh, and then there are some several science group who are working on different science problem. I mean, you know, based on the data, uh, mm -hmm. and, and therefore uh, you know uh, uh, you know how, how does it work? Uh, like you know, there are many astrophysics problem also. Maybe there are many you know. Uh, Probably, as I mentioned, a zero measurement problem, which is more like a cosmological problem, and maybe the supernova, uh, how supernova evolves, that might be a different kind of problem. Uh, is it like broken into different science groups, like other collaborations, like? Um, when it comes to JWST's observations, uh, it is not a design survey, or it is not meant to be a design survey in that sense, where. You know there is a, a big collaboration that actually governs these um, uh, the facility and and you know the facility observes according to a set plan before. This is not going to be the case, of course. Um, where different people can make different collaborations and then can come up with uh, proposals, okay. which you know if selected, then JWST will execute them. Uh, you know this is a peer review process, uh, and if it goes to these committees. Uh, or you know the the peer review of of proposal selection, then invariably uh, you know JWST will do uh, an observation, and and you know Hubble has done this before. Hubble has used used hundreds of its orbits to to a special cause, to a special kind of observation. Uh, in fact, right now Hubble is actually doing a thousand orbit observation of young stellar objects. Um, uh, it's called a Ulysses program. Uh, so, so you know the, these are the things that people can come up with and they say that okay we have this definite problem we have come together we have a definite uh, an observing a proposal uh, can we do it on this and if if it looks good yes you can do it okay uh, unless of course it takes all the time <laughs> then so, so it's, it's more like you get certain hours or certain number of days from the telescope uh, to observe okay yes yes okay. you do right okay thanks Actually, I have a, this is Nilanjana Sengupta. I have a very simplistic question. Firstly, thanks for the very nice talk. Uh, you know, from the news, I read that, uh, you know, these images correspond to 800 million years after the Big Bang. Uh, mm -hmm. That 800 million years is, you know, is it related to the longest wavelength that uh, Webb can capture? I mean, can we go further back? Can we go to, you know, say 200 million uh, years from the Big Bang, and what would that require? Yes, 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 absolutely. This is this is a very very nice question. Um, right. So when we when you know in the uh, in the public uh, domain when this is said, this all pertains to the depth. So which is the faintest and the farthest source you can see that kind of defines the depth of your observation. So in this case, this was again in a twelve-hour observation. And you just go through the entire field and try to see. In fact, you have to go through individual object and see what what the redshift is. Uh, and in this case, this is the farthest uh, you know source that was detected. However, if you if you integrate even for longer, 
then it is much it is much more likely that you'll start seeing even further further uh, sources or galaxies uh, which will so basically it's it's a question of time commitment uh, the more signal you accumulate, accumulate the so even with the, you don't need perhaps a newer uh, telescope you, even with this you can actually tune it to capture earlier times is that what is that what you kind of uh, that, that is that is essentially true for any telescope you just take a, a you know a, a six six inch telescope and you train it at the sky for thousands of hours you can actually see uh, you know earliest sources in principle mm -hmm. you can show the earliest sources however the point becomes that you know this is one becomes feasibility at some point you cannot do it for so for example with hubble there are certain observations you cannot do it because it takes hundreds hundreds of orbits um, so then when we have a next uh, Hubble in UV and, and an optical, which is much larger, you can do it in one hour. So that's when that's why people continue to push, uh, you know, the boundary and get new telescopes. Uh, but yeah, you can use the, the existing telescope and use just just give it time uh, okay. to do it. So, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. But Devapan, uh... Isn't it also a constraint of the bandwidth of the wavelength? I mean, oh, farther... oh, yes. Yeah, okay. That is definitely true. Now, in this particular case, of course, uh, you know, there is, of course, certain, it, it's not going to be, it's going to be stretched into infrared, but it is not going to be stretched into radio because, you know, we, from our models, we know that, you know, earliest of galaxies. Uh, even if you do cosmological redshift on that, then unless, of course, our model changes and we, we have new science, um, uh, you know, we will always be for these earliest uh, light from these earliest galaxies, we will always be in the infrared regime. So as long as you are in that bandwidth, you can you can capture them. Right. Um, but yes, of course, you know, if you have some a different type of signal as in CMB, of course, then, of course, you need to get to a different band and and do uh, you know, a, a different type of observation. Okay, and and just another small question. In in an angular sense, how much coverage do we have of data? Like you're saying, we look at very very small angles each time, right? So in an overall yes. integrated angular sense, how much coverage? Uh, these well, for these telescopes, even including Hubble, these are only a few arc minutes. So you know, even in the widest. Um, uh, coverage. I do not have a number right of the, of the top of my head, but these are not wide field instruments. Uh, the reason that they are not wide field because you know, you know they're designed to study deep. Um, so that's why Hubble is also not a wide field instrument. However, um, there are telescopes in plan, as as I mentioned. For example, the the Roman Space Telescope. This this is going to be another infrared telescope. But it will be different from JWST because this will be a wide field instrument. It is not going to be as sensitive as, as JWST, but this will be much, much wider so that you can do large survey science with the telescope. So in one point, you can actually get a much larger area of the sky. Uh, and, uh, and if you just go online, I think there are comparisons available uh, of the field of view of the Roman Space Telescope and the field of view of Hubble. Um, okay. And you can actually see how tiny Hubble's field of view is compared to the. Uh, so yes, these are specifically designed to do different type of science. Uh, Roman will do a lot of survey science. Um, right, right. We need, yeah. But yeah, you can do the same thing with JWST. You just have to do it many, many times. <laughs> so that's the thing. Right, right. No, I guess I meant more in an integrated sense since the beginning of humanity, different telescopes looking here, there, oh, just a general right. sense of, I just wanted a general sense of how much angularly have we looked out? Just even if it's like a rough ballpark estimate, just curious, or maybe there is um, more. Well, I don't take my word for it uh, in a sense uh -huh. that, you know, I don't really know a solid number, but then if you right. look at surveys like SDSS, right, uh, which actually uh -huh. have looked at considerable fraction of the sky i would say 30 percent uh again okay. you know, don't take my word as a as a solid number but we have seen 30 to 40 percent of the sky you know in this in the service and if you put 
pick everything together, I would say the number would be much higher. Um, but again, these are different depths and you know, different types of observations. But yeah, I don't really know a number, but it would be a considerable fraction of the sky that you have seen already. Okay, okay. good. But that is one of the rough sense. Thanks. Yeah, it's a sphere. It's a sphere around us, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Do we have any other question? Edi, are you around? Edi, hello, Edi. Uh, hello, do uh, you maybe uh, Edi? Yes. Uh, it yeah, seems I like don't see. Got disconnected. Yes. Uh, okay. Yes. So, uh, yeah, thank you very much. I don't. Uh, so, anyone has if. If there is no further questions and comments, so let's uh, thank uh, Devapom. I mean, it's a wonderful talk, and probably the first time uh, we are here, uh, about uh, the telescope, uh, and that also soon after the big release. So, uh, Devapom, thank you very much. Thank you. So, thank you. Uh, you're most welcome. Thank very you. Welcome. Welcome. And it was a pleasure. And, uh, and uh, as you mentioned at the beginning, that probably. Uh, you know, uh, you will be visiting India, so do uh, do plan to stop by to Isaac Kolkata. It would be, it would be great. Well, I'll definitely uh, try to do that. Yeah, and I'll ask okay. ADG to uh, be in touch with you. Uh, ADG is here. Yeah, ADG is here. Yes. yes. Maybe ADG for closing remarks. ADG, we can't hear you. We can't hear you, sir. Problem? Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, yes. we can hear you. Yeah, my connection has been behaving very crazy over the last few minutes. Thankfully, I heard the entire talk, but uh, yeah. I'm I'm not sure whether I will be disconnected any moment now. So I must thank Devapom for his wonderful talk, which I didn't get to. Complete. I promise that I will not ask him But <laughs> can I ask? Not a question, really, it's more of a comment. It seems from social media news uh, stories that. This is more like a competition between Hubble and Webb. And if that's the way things are being portrayed in most oh, yes. social media. Yes. It seems from your talk that it's more like a collaboration. Would you like to elaborate on that rather than a competition? Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah, this is, I think, that is probably the, uh, you know, the easiest way for the social media or the media to portray it is as a competition. But there is no competition, actually, because Hubble and JWST, they observe or their, their specializations are in a completely different areas. Um, although JWST is the new flagship observatory of NASA because of its size and money and uh, you know everything involved, but Hubble is definitely not at this point in any competition directly, uh, but exactly as you say that it is, it is definitely uh, more of a collaboration and we are all excited about it. And just by looking at the proposals that are coming into STSCI, I can tell you that people already have jumped into that ship of collaboration because people want to observe the same thing with, with Hubble and JWST to complement uh, the information you get from these different bands and know more about those uh, targets. Uh, it will be a competition with JWST when the next great observatory will come up and that's currently in the plan um probably in 2030s or 2040s uh, where that will be, that will be a true successor of hubble which will will be bigger mirror uh, and capabilities in uv and op, uh, optical but definitely not jws it is it's more like a collaboration than a competition yes so, so is it the same sort of scientists are working also in the hubble and and the, and the jwst kind of, or is it like two different type of people all together. No, 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 the same. So for example, you know, if you are interested in a particular aspect of galaxy evolution, and you know that you can get your signal, uh, you know, different physical processes, uh, emit signal in different bands, um, or you can actually look at star formation as unobscured, uh, then you would like to do both, right? You would like to use Hubble's UV uh, to get a part of the signal and get one part of the picture, and then you would like to get the IR. Uh, to get the other part of the picture so sometimes the same 
uh, scientists or the group of scientists, they are uh, observing um, with both the instruments and sometimes at the very same time. So we have been seeing requests of coordinated observation. So Hubble and JWST will point at the same patch of the sky at the very same time. Okay, yeah, it's, yeah, okay, thanks. It, it's it's more like like many of this, uh, like uh, land observatory is also doing, I mean, they have like coordinated gamma ray observation, similar, similar like that. Maybe. Very similar, yes, yes. So will it be part of LIGO collaboration also in that sense, like if they have uh, some gravitational excited um, gravitational web sources? Yes, yes. You, so, uh, well, I mean, I shouldn't say that it will be, but I can say that JWST, that's like Hubble, has this, uh, uh, we call them TO, uh, it's target of opportunity uh, programs. Um, and sometimes they're disruptive. So disruptive means that you are observing and then suddenly this trigger happened of target of opportunity. And then the telescope drops what it was doing before and then moves to this new target, which is you know something very exciting that's happening and time critical. Um, so these are called the TOs. So yes, that, that is definitely uh, JWST will do that too, uh, if something okay. like that happens. Well, that's the exciting thing. I mean, we'll have oh, yes. even more better, better data. Yes. Are, are there any further questions? Because we have already time, especially on this topic. But uh, if there are no other questions, I would just like to share one thing with the audience. Uh, was speaking a bit under the weather, and he was a great person who was speaking for more than 10 years. No, Eddie, we can't hear you properly. Okay. No, the one thing I wanted to share with the audience is uh, Devobong was a bit under the weather and he was afraid that he may not be able to continue for more than 30 minutes or so. But I think the excitement of the discovery has been so much that given to have forgotten about his ailment right now. Oh, yes. So, <laughs> so if there are no further questions, let us thank the speaker. And okay. no, thank you very much. Thank you. So, ADG, so I can guarantee that you have been able to answer my question this time. So, oh, I, I, I'm glad that you didn't answer, ask any questions, sir. So, ADG, so, uh, so when you when you dropped out, I I requested Devopom that whenever he visits uh, Calcutta next time, probably he should he should drop by also to Isaac Kolkata, and and you will be in touch with Devopom for sure. Great, that will be. Definitely okay. try to. Thank you. So thanks again for this wonderful talk. And uh, so we will just call it a day today. Uh, we will definitely look forward to seeing you on our campus. And with definitely much better pictures by that time, I guess. Oh, I, I'm sure. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Uh -huh. Bye, Devo Pom. Take care. Bye, -bye. Bye, Bye. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye, Devo Pom. Bye. Take care. Bye, yeah. Bye. Bye. I think my son is still interested in holding up. Now. Yeah. Okay. Take care. Bye. Bye, everybody.